Hello everyone, happy holidays. It's the end of the semester and it's the last screencast to give you some feedback on, on your final assignment. And um, I want to thank you for giving me a little extra time to work on it. And so I'm getting it to you on Tuesday, the day that I said I would. I think I have about three more to grade, but um, I've graded enough to where I think I can give you some overall feedback. And because it is the holidays, I have some Christmas music in the background. I don't know if you can hear it, but um, it'll be there. So uh, here we go. So I want to give you some collective feedback on your assignment and particularly address some of the weaknesses that I saw. But overall, um, there were some things that I'm really pleased about and um, and I'll talk about that um, as we go through. Um, as I go through, I am going to be going from very specific information to general information about test taking um, or responding to essay prompts that you might have to do for the EdTPA. So um, I'm going to first start off on specific items, on specific things that I want to address, and then go to the more general ideas. Um, okay. So the first thing is, and guess what? If you're listening to my Christmas music playlist, it has you too, um, New Year's Day. How is that on there? It's not very Christmassy. Okay. Here we go. Hear that? It's Elvis Presley. All right. Um, first thing I want to address about um, the the first what the rubric um, addresses learning objectives and the alignment and the assessment so but I'm and all of that together but I'm going to address them in three parts so I'm going to first focus on the learning objectives there are some things that I want you to do and there are some things that I want you to avoid um, clearly the thing that I want you to do is to use cognitive verbs in your learning objectives that's an important thing because you want to identify in your learning objectives what are the thinking skills that students will need in order to complete the assessment. So use cognitive verbs um, and we talked about Bloom's taxonomy. There are others and other people may talk about Webb's uh, domains of knowledge. That's fine but it's important that you use cognitive verbs. Um, and you want to make sure that you avoid the non-cognitive and measurable verbs. And those include uh, phrasings like demonstrate the ability, understand, learn, know, or analyze, evaluate, and create. And these are verbs that you want to avoid using even though, um, even though they are listed in Bloom's taxonomy and they may even be listed in um, Webb's domains of knowledge, but the reason why we want to avoid them is because they're not getting very specific. Those are sort of like, um, uh, they're the broad verbs. Um, they are, they're not very specific. So it's sort of like if I'm writing a novel and I say, well, the, the person moved across the room. Well, that's not very descriptive right it's sort of like a broad heading of how the person might have moved across the room but you can be more descriptive and say the person ran or the person walked or the person sauntered those are very specific and it gives a clearer picture of what the person is doing likewise when writing learning objectives we want to be have a clearer perspective um, of what the student needs to do to complete the assessment and this is very important because some of these cognitive processes vary. So um, identifying the main idea may be very different than categorizing um, items. So we want to make sure that we're clear. Both of those are analyzed, but they are very different cognitive processes. So we want to be clear. So use cognitive verbs, avoid the vague ones as much as possible. And in some cases, I've tried to indicate where if someone used a, an, an unclear verb, I tried to indicate that. 
So the last, second thing that I want to address regarding the learning objectives is the assessment. Um, you are in the lesson plan. You are supposed to supposed to identify your learning objectives and also identify the assessment. That this was a common problem, and it may be because of what is being taught in other classes. But in my class, I really see the formative assessment as an assessment that measures what each student can do. So what I saw in many cases were students were writing for the formative assessment informal assessments. Now I've made the distinction in the screencast between informal and formal assessments and formative assessment as well as summative assessment. Um, but somehow, since that time, we, have, we may have gotten confused. So I just want to make sure that I clarify it. And this is what I, I tried to indicate in response on your, um, on your assignment. So formative assessment, if I'm asking for a formative assessment, I want something that each and every child, some kind of data that you can get from each and every child. So that could be tickets out the door, exit tickets, mini tests, a question or two, something that you're going to collect from each and every student um, that lets you know how well they are mastering the objective. So student, discuss student discussions or partner talk or posters worked on by the group are not considered acceptable forms of formative assessments and um, from my point of view, and I've indicated that on the assignment. Um, so be, oh, the other thing that I want to uh, indicate is that um, in many case, in some cases, not many cases, in some cases, people talked about an assignment and they said, um, like a poster or um, a, uh, um, I'm blanking out on an example, but or like some kind of exit ticket. But what this, what you failed to do was to really be specific about what is on that exit ticket, or um, what students need to do. So really be descriptive about it. Talk about I'm going to ask the question where students are going to be. Uh, have to um, identify or define what is figurative language. Say, you know, be very specific. Or I'm going to give students a graphic organizer and students are going to have to indicate um, which items are similes and which ones are metaphors. Okay? All right, so now we got some Run DMC singing. But anyway, uh, let's go on. Last thing, alignment. So what I wanted to see is when you wrote your learning objective, do they align with your assessment? And also, do those things align with your instructional activities? Now, this is really um, an important thing, because if you're going to say that this is what you want students to do to complete an assessment, you want to be able to show that you can identify what the cognitive skills are and that you are going to be focusing on that. Um, in many cases, People did that in very spectacular ways. So it's one of the, you know, yay moments is that I can see and people really made an effort to go through and say, okay, I want students to do this. So these are the three things that I'm going to cover in my um, learning objectives or in my instructional activities. The one thing that I will say, though, is that, and I think it's a reflection of your being very new to the field, and, and in many cases, many of you have not yet gone out and taught. So you wrote these lesson plans where you know you're going to be addressing several things. Um, you want students to define fig figurative language. You want students to identify the different types of um, a figurative language in a text. You want students to be able to generate, and then you want students to uh, uh, generate a poem. So generate the examples of uh, figurative language as well as generate a poem. So those are four things, and those are four big things. Um, and don't expect that those four things can be done easily in a lesson plan. Um, and uh, 
you might want to break that up into two lessons. But anyways, but I want to say that I was really happy to see that alignment. When I didn't see that alignment, I tried to indicate that. All right. Uh, the fourth thing I want to talk about is the use of theoretical terms. And uh, remember, I said that I really want everybody to define and apply. So there were two questions. There were actually three questions that were designed for you to be thinking about defining and applying. One was, of course, the learning theory. The second, of course, was motivation. And the third was scaffold. And that's where I think many people um, may have missed that as, a, as an opportunity to, yet again, define what you know about scaffolds and apply it in particular places. What often happened was that people just gave examples of scaffolds. Um, and it may be because scaffolds is such a common educational construct that you felt like you didn't need to define it. Well, that may be true in other cases, but in my class, it was a concept that we did talk about. We talked about Jerome Bruner. We talked about um, how it's an offshoot of zone of proximal development. We talked about how it's a difference between tools and scaffolds. Um, scaffolds are different from tools, um, how it's designed to support learning. So in my class, my thinking was that that is a, um, a theoretical construct that I wanted you to define and apply it. So what I got was a lot of applications, but not so many definitions. So uh, I, I tended to note that um, in many of your responses. In some cases, I got really wonderful definitions, but in many cases, that was uh, a missed opportunity. So please be aware that that, you know, try to find opportunities to define um, instructional or theoretical terms like scaffold. Speaking of theoretical terms, social constructivism, uh, in that one people are defining and applying. So the definition, you know, a lot of people talk about the importance of talk and um, what I was really happy about is that nobody talked about how, you know, it's important for kids to be social or that they learn from each other. I didn't hear those misconceptions. That was great. You understand that talk is important. And so when you began to apply, you base, uh, many people would write, well, because talk is important, I'm going to provide opportunities for them to talk, which is where the partner talk comes in or the small group work opportunity comes in. And that was it. But what I would like you to do is to explain what you hope students will be talking about. Um, be very specific. If you want students to be in a partner talk situation and they're reading text, you hope that they are able to, you know, to identify similes and metaphors and that, you know, that by doing that, they're becoming clear as to what the definition of a simile is or what a metaphor is or they're becoming more clear as to what examples of similes or, or metaphors are. So you're just really trying to um, provide them opportunity for them to make sense of the, of, of the concept. Engagement. Um, there were um, instances where students talked about autonomy. Actually, I think autonomy was the or belonging, autonomy or belonging were the biggest ones that students talked about. I don't think anybody talked about growth mindset, which I'm shocked. Um, and I think maybe very few talked about competency. But um, what ended up happening is that uh, when students did talk about one of these, they talked about it, talked about it separate from DC and Ryan's self-determination theory. So I would like you to include self-determination theory in your definition. So if you're going to talk about autonomy, talk about autonomy as being part of DC and Ryan's self-determination theory. So now those are the specifics. Now I want to talk about some of the general ideas about just responding to essays. Um, the 
these are just advice recommendations that I give to you and the first one is be sure to follow the prompt so uh, check your work make sure that you are responding to the prompt in very specific ways um, check your work in some instances there you know with the motivation one it says to give three examples and sometimes I didn't get three examples or sometimes it wasn't very clear um, so check your work make sure that you're providing three examples um, my job in the future is to make sure that those prompts are very clear so that you know what to do um, but you know check your work and if you're unsure email me or the professor to let you know say hey am I in the right track this other thing that I would like you to do is to consider your audience right for your audience and what I mean by that is um, make the job easy for them him or her or in this instance me um, make it enjoyable I don't want you to joke but I want you to write clearly so I don't have to go around looking for information I want you to treat it like an interview so I want you to put your best foot forward and show your best work um, um, you have to be very clear about what it is that you are writing about and just you know show um, the reviewer that you know a lot in some instances I read things and it was just very short uh, paragraphs when you know and I'm not big on writing long things but um, they were really too short they were a little too brief as to what needed to be put in there so for the ed tpa be sure to you know show the reviewer that you know stuff um, for this assignment show me that you have listened to uh, the screencast that you've participated in discussions that you've made sense of the material show me that you know when you're writing about autonomy that you know that it comes from VC and Ryan self-determination theory if you're writing about scaffold show me that you know that it comes from Jerome Bruner and it's associated with Vygotsky's uh, zone of proximal development um, if you're going to be talking about zone of proximal de development show me that you know that it's Vygotsky's work so there's a way to show your knowledge don't just be brief and concise really show and elaborate on your work all right so with that being said um, happy holidays to you and um, I hope you have a good time with your friends and your family and that uh, the new year will be the beginning of something really special. All right, let me know if you have any questions. Bye-bye.